and on some housekeeping. Welcome to today's webinar, Impact of Multiple Chronic Conditions on Therapeutic Outcomes in Patients with Implantable Cardioverter Defibrillators. This web series is coordinated by the Aging Initiative, which is an R24 funded initiative that brings the expertise and leadership of two powerhouses for research on multiple chronic conditions. Powerhouses, our healthcare systems research network, NIH funded Cla Cla D Pepper Center, Older American Independent Centers, or Pepper Centers. Uh, the initiative is led by Dr. Jerry Gerwitz at University of Massachusetts and Myers Primary Care Institute, along with co PIs Elizabeth Bayless and Jane Magaziner. My name is Leah Hansen. I'm a senior investigator at Health Partners in Minneapolis, and I co lead the Age Initiative Dissemination work group with Heather Whitson, faculty in the Duke University Pepper Center. Before we get started, I need to cover a few technical details. Number of registrants for today's webinar, we have placed phone lines on mute to reduce audio feedback. So unless you are logged in as a host or a panelist, your line is automatically muted. However, we welcome and encourage audience participation using the Q&A or chat features of the webinar software. If you're in your Cisco webinar portal or the tab that says presentation and you look to the upper right, you should see an icon for a chat and an icon for a Q&A. If you have questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A function to submit those. Heather and I will keep an eye out for those questions under the Q&A icon. As time permits, we will read questions for our speakers after the presentation. If you have technical or logistical questions, we ask that you submit those using the chat function. Please, you are identified by either your name or participant ID, so our webinar hosts will be able to troubleshoot any problem you're having with audio or other issues. With the function, you can choose whether you'd like your comment to be visible to everyone, or you can choose to send the question to only the hosts. We extend a huge thank you to Catherine and Zoni and her team, who do amazing work behind the scenes to make these webinars possible. They will be monitoring the chat functions today to help with technical troubleshooting. I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Duke is a postdoctoral fellow in the Yale School of Medicine's T32 training program in bariatric clinical epidemiology and aging-related research led by Tom Gill. She completed her doctoral training in clinical and population health research at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, Myers Primary Care Institute. Dr. Hajduk's research interests lie at the intersection of geriatric conditions and cardiovascular disease. She examines how mobility impairment, cognitive impairment, and multiple chronic conditions affect disease management and functional outcomes in older adults with heart failure and myocardial infarction. Into her work on the Aging Initiative Pilot Project, Dr. Hajduk studies geriatric impairments in a comprehensive evaluation of risk factors in older patients with acute myocardial infarction, or SILVER AMI study, which is a longitudinal study of 3,000 myocardial infarction patients aged 75 and older, led by Dr. Chowdhury at Yale. Our second speaker, Dr. Tanetti, is the Gladys Phillips Crowfoot Professor of Medicine and Public Health and Chief of Geriatrics at Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Tanetti is a leading expert in the area of falls risk factor identification and prevention. Her research focus is on clinical decision making for older adults in the face of multiple health conditions, measure net benefit and harms of commonly used medications, and the importance of cross disease universal health outcomes. She is leading a national interdisciplinary effort to develop and test a model of health care that reminds primary and specialty care to focus on the health priorities of older adults with multiple and complex health needs. She will be presenting the results of the Aging Initiative pilot study that she and Dr. Alan Go led, which examined the influence of multiple chronic conditions on therapeutic outcomes in recipients of implantable cardioverter defibrillators. Tenney will follow with a discussion of the challenges of delivering health care to complex older adults, such as multi older adults considering ICD implantation, and will present some ideas for shifting the goals of health care from disease-centered to patient-goal-centered in older adults with multiple chronic conditions. We pass it to you, Dr. Hajduk. Thank you, Leah. 
Okay. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Leah. Uh, thank you for joining us today as we present the findings from our Aging Initiative pilot project. Just want to be sure that um, the screen is up and everybody can see my slides. If I could get a, a yay from Catherine on that. All right. Wonderful. Great. Great. As I mentioned, today we'll be um, I'll be talking about uh, the project um, that Dr. Alan Go and I led, exploring the association of multiple chronic conditions with therapy outcomes on um, recipients of implantable cardioverter defibrillators or ICDs. So in the next 25 minutes or so, um, I'll first present our rationale for studying multiple chronic conditions uh, in the context of ICD implantation. And I'll touch a little bit upon uh, the population of patients uh, who are eligible for ICDs and policy changes that have greatly expanded coverage of ICDs in the Medicare population. And I'll present the findings of our investigation looking at the association of multiple chronic conditions with receipt of appropriate and inappropriate ICD therapies. And lastly, I'll discuss the implications of our findings um, for guiding multimorbid patients and their physicians in making decisions about whether to undergo ICD implantation. Before I get to that, I just want to take a second to acknowledge the outstanding collaborators from the HCSRN and Pepper Centers who helped make this research possible. So the senior PI of the study, uh, Dr. Alan Go, as well as the senior data analyst, uh, Grace Tabata, and Sue He Sung and all the invites, came to the project from Kaiser Permanente, Northern California. Eric Gerwich, uh, the PI of the Aging Initiative and collaborating investigator, comes from UMass Medical School in, in Massachusetts. Sudi, co-PI of the Longitudinal Study on Implantable Cardioverter Defibrillators, um, the data set used in this project, and David Magid, come from Kaiser Permanente, uh, Colorado. Bob Greenlee, um, another co-PI of the Longitudinal Study of ICDs, um, came from the Marshfield Clinic. So had quite a good representation of investigators and research staff um, from the HCSRN. On this, oh, I'm sorry, one moment, just, just uh, there we go. On the D side, we had uh, myself, the junior investigator on the study, um, as well as Tom Gill, uh, head of the Pepper Center at Yale and um, Heather Lohr, Head of the Biostatistics Corps, the Yale Program on Aging. So now we are out of the way, um, we can get down to the heart of the matter. So for a little bit of background, ICDs are electronic devices whose main purpose is to increase the risk of sudden cardiac death, uh, sensing and terminating potentially fatal cardiac arrhythmias via either shocks or anti-tachycardia pacing. The rate of ICD implantation in America has really skyrocketed in recent years, from just 25,000 in 1997 to about 175,000 in 2011. And this rise is likely due to a number of reasons. Um, first, seminal trials such as the multicenter automatic defibrillator uh, implantation trial and the cardiac death and heart failure trial um, these came out in the early 2000s and showed that ICDs can reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death by 25 uh, to 60 percent, which is really quite astounding. Based on these compelling data from clinical trials, in 2005, CMS greatly expanded its coverage for ICD implantation um, to include many patients, uh, including those with non-ischemic heart disease and an ejection fraction less than 35%, also those with ischemic heart disease and a history of heart attack um, and an ejection fraction of less than 35%. And policy change made more than half a million Medicare beneficiaries eligible for ICD implantation. Important in the context of looking at ICDs um, in patients with multiple chronic conditions is that a contraindication of the coverage of ICDs by CMS was any disease um, associated with a likelihood of survival of less than one year. So that's something to keep in mind. So in the population of real world patients uh, with indications for ICD placement are much older and sicker than highly selected trial participants on which the CMS coverage guidelines are based. Um, for example, um, seminal trials, um, the average age of, of folks in seminal trials was late 50s or early 60s, whereas, whereas the average participant hospitalized with heart failure and an ejection fraction of less than 35 is about 75. Our clinical trials also systematically excluded participants with certain comorbidities or those with a life expectancy of less than the study period, which was often three to four years, where the average participant hospitalized with ICD indications has at least two comorbidities and a pretty substantial one-year mortality risk. 
the real world outcomes of ICD implementation are not as rosy as we might hope. A uh, recent study out of Dan Kramer's group at Harvard found that over half of ICD recipients age 65 and older die or are in hospice within five years of implantation. And other studies, including one by Westerdahl uh, and colleagues in 2014, have found that the majority of ICD recipients die of non-arrhythmic causes. For example, uh, in this case, 87% uh, of ICD recipients in the Westerdahl study died from non-arrhythmic causes. That these increased uh, competing risks of death from non-sudden cardiac causes translates into reduced benefits of ICDs in patients with multiple chronic conditions, um, at least in terms of survival. Uh, in this 2014 study from Jack Heart Failure, we see that the uh, mortality benefits of having an ICD start to diminish among patients uh, with just two comorbidities. And by the time you get to four uh, comorbidities, there's pretty much no survival benefit associated with ICD implantation. So I hope that the findings can cause us pause um, when considering whether ICD implantation um, is the best choice for patients with multiple chronic conditions and competing risks of death. In addition to the uncertainty of survival benefit among ICD recipients with multiple chronic conditions, we also have to consider what additional downsides to ICD implantation they may face. Things such as infection, which occur in about 5% of implants um, and increase with age. Cost. Uh, ICDs are very expensive, costing on average $30,000 to $50,000, which might not be a prudent use of funds um, if the benefits are limited. Um, End-of-life issues also abound, particularly in older multimorbid adults who have to make tough decisions about device revisions and battery replacements, um, and especially deactivation as they progress towards the end of life. And lastly, believe it or not, uh, a major issue um, that folks who are considering ICD implantation have to live with is the possibility that they may be shocked at any time, which is the job of the ICD, but ICD therapies can be painful and disruptive. Um, and to add insult to injury, um, some ICD therapies are inappropriate, meaning they confer absolutely no clinical benefit, but are injurious to the health and welfare of ICD recipients. So a little about inappropriate ICD therapies. Um, I, uh, inappropriate therapy might take the form of shocks um, or ATP with def different negative sequelae associated with each. Inappropriate therapies comprise up to a third of all ICD therapies. And given that about a third of all ICD recipients uh, can expect to receive uh, some type of therapy over the, the life of their device, this translates into a risk of 10 to 20 percent for receipt of inappropriate therapy for every person who receives an ICD. Mm -hmm. And uh, negative consequences of inappropriate ICD therapy are pain and psychological distress. Uh, ICD shocks tend to be very painful, with some patients likening the feeling to getting kicked in the chest. Um, this is potentially an acceptable consequence when the therapy is life-saving, but burdensome when the therapy is of, of little benefit. Uh, appropriate ICD therapy has also been consistently associated with increased anxiety, uh, depression, reduced quality of life. Um, in addition, increases healthcare utilization um, as patients who receive shocks or ATPs often seek emergency treatment afterwards. And Several studies have found that inappropriate shocks actually uh, increase risk of mortality um, and perhaps by way of injury to the myocardium. Um, one study in Jack from 2011 found that just one inappropriate shock was associated with a 60% increased odds of mortality over uh, the three and a half year follow-up of the study and that mortality risk increased linearly for patients receiving multiple inappropriate therapies. Inappropriate ICD therapy is certainly something that we would like to minimize. Um, and although knowledge about risk factors for appropriate and inappropriate therapy remains limited, we do know that, uh, a few things, such as men are more likely to receive appropriate shocks than women, and other patient characteristics, such as younger age, a very low ejection fraction, and uh, specifically comorbidities, most notably atrial fibrillation, but also prior heart attacks, supraventricular tachycardia, and hypertension, have been associated with increased risk of inappropriate therapy. So comorbid conditions are a driver of inappropriate ICD therapy, and that inappropriate therapy may affect both the quality and quality of life in ICD recipients. 
Uh, in this study, we sought to find out uh, how might multiple chronic conditions, which are really quite prevalent in the ICD population, um, how might they affect risk of appropriate and inappropriate ICD therapy? And how might this uh, influence of MCCs on risk of therapy tip the scales of risk and benefit of ICDs for patients with uh, multiple chronic conditions? And question, we use data from the longitudinal study of implantable cardioverter defibrillators, or LSICD, as I've mentioned before. Um, the LSICD is a retrospective cohort study of, of just about 2,800 primary prevention ICD recipients who were recruited from 14 sites um, from seven uh, participating cardiovascular research network um, systems, and that was within the broader healthcare systems research network. Participants were recruited at the time of implantation uh, from January 2006 to December 2009 and followed up for a maximum of three years um, with average follow-up follow time just about two and a half years. All participants in the study had documented left regular systolic dysfunction and, and all participants had been part of one of the participating um, HCSRN health systems for at least a year prior to implantation. So, so ICD um, study co-PIs, Drs. Masudi and Magid, as the study leadership members, Drs. Greenley, they came up with a pretty ingenious design for collecting data from three unique sources for this study. They tapped, uh, the National Cardiovascular Data Registry's um, ICD registry, which is a CMS-mandated registry that captures data on most ICD implants in the United States uh, to collect information on ICD eligibility and device information. They also leverage data from uh, the Virtual Data Warehouse, which is a data collection consortium operated by the HCSRN, uh, to collect information on medical history and comorbidity, as well as demographics, um, healthcare utilization, and mortality. And they, uh, the truly novel part of the LSICD was the creation of the ICD therapy data repository um, that rigorously collected data on ICD therapies for up to three years after device implantation. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So finally, we captured uh, comorbidity data for up to three years prior to ICD implantation. For our comorbidities, we started off with a list of 15 conditions recommended by CMS and the Department of Health and Human Services, a strategic framework on multiple chronic conditions. As you can see, this list contains uh, most of the heavy hitter comorbidities that we tend to worry about. Um, and we did have to exclude heart failure from this list due to its near ubiquity in this study sample. On this list of 14, we added 10 additional comorbidities that were either common among ICD recipients or potentially impactful for our ICD therapy outcomes. And so this resulted in a list of 24 comorbidities for consideration um, in MCC measures. For MCC measure comorbidity counts, we assigned a value of one uh, to each comorbidity and examined the distribution of the sum of comorbidities across the sample. And based on this distribution, we applied a quartile-based cutoff that categorized participants into four groups, those with zero to three, uh, four to five, six to seven, and eight or more comorbidities. In co uh, morbidity counts, we also performed cluster analyses to examine whether there were any common or, or meaningful groups of comorbidities may impact risk of ICD therapy. So there are many, many ways to perform cluster analyses, and we chose a common method called hierarchical agglomerative clustering uh, to identify groups of comorbidities. This is a pretty good method to use when you don't know exactly what the constitution um, of, of groups you're looking for uh, looks like, and, you, and because it lets the data speak for itself. Um, so with this method, each comorbidity begins as an individual cluster, and then it's merged with similar comorbidities based on uh, similarity coefficients. In this case, we use Jacquard, uh, which is appropriate for binary data. And to help us decide on the final number and designation of the clusters, we use a technique uh, called Ward's minimum variance method. Um, and it's a technique in which every possible co cluster combination is, um, is considered to create the smallest addition to the error sum of squares um, in the overall model. And we tested this with a statistic called the pseudo F statistic. We graphically examined the clusters um, that were found through our analyses through um, uh, using a dendrogram. And with this, you can kind of 
see how clinically relevant all the clusters are. So this is just an example that I took from a BMC geriatrics article in 2011. And it's, um, we're followed up for ICD therapy outcomes, either shocks or ATP, uh, through December of 2011. And these ICD therapies were identified uh, via medical record abstraction at the study site, um, were then confirmed and categorized by a central committee of electrophysiologists and hospitalists. Um, an expert external committee then also reviewed selected records and confirmed the type and appropriateness of ICD therapy. And all of these reviews were conducted um, in the context of review of precedent literature and extensive uh, discussion between the committee members. The outcomes related to ICD therapy in this cohort. First, use Cox proportional hazards regression to examine the association of multiple chronic conditions with time to first therapy, uh, be it any therapy, appropriate therapy, or inappropriate therapy. We also examined the total burden of all uh, inappropriate and appropriate therapy using Poisson regression. Lastly, we examined the relative risk of inappropriate versus appropriate therapy using relative risk regression. So, so LSICD cohort, we excluded 555 participants who had not been members of one of the HCSRN health systems for at least a year prior to implantation. We excluded three participants who were under 21 years old and seven participants who unfortunately died during implantation. So this left us with an analytic uh, sample of 2,235. Six um, of the sample were, were quite representative of the population of ICD recipients in the National Registry, which is great. Uh, average age of the cohort was about 69. About a quarter were women, and nearly a third were non-white or Hispanic. The uh, device type was pretty evenly split among the cohort, and mean ejection fraction prior to implantation was about 25%. Uh, for comorbidities, the average number of comorbidities in the sample out of a possible 24 was six. Um, our quartile-based cutoffs of comorbidities yielded slightly lopsided groups due to a large number of participants having four comorbidities. So about 15% of the sample fell into the zero to three comorbidity group uh, and slightly less than 30% falling into the four to five, six to seven, and eight or more comorbidity groups. Um, ICD therapy occurred in 27% of the cohort during follow-up, 18% received at least one appropriate therapy, and 10% received at least one inappropriate therapy. The total number of ICD therapies per patient was higher as comorbidity counts increased, ranging from 0.77 therapies per participant in the 0 to 3 comorbidity group to 1.1 in the 8 or more comorbidity group. Patients with eight or more comorbidities appear to be at, uh, at appear to have a greater incidence of any ICD therapy during follow-up, as you can see in the top bars. And we parsed out um, the incidence of therapy into appropriate and inappropriate domains, as displayed in the bottom two sets of bars. We found a trend towards increased incidence of inappropriate but not appropriate therapy among participants with higher comorbidity burden. With these associations in adjusted regression analyses, we similarly found that higher comorbidity counts were associated with a shorter time to first therapy, particularly among participants with eight or more comorbidities. And interestingly, when we stratified the outcome into appropriate versus inappropriate therapy, we found that higher comorbidity counts were monotonically associated with time to inappropriate therapy, but not time to appropriate therapy. In the association of MCCs with total burden of ICD therapy uh, over the course of follow-up, we found that higher comorbidity uh, counts were associated with increased burden of ICD therapy. And again, when stratified, higher comorbidity count was associated with a higher burden of inappropriate therapy, but not appropriate therapy. And it looked the, the, the most highly multimorbid patients bear the highest uh, burden of therapy in follow-up. Up. The 562 participants who had received some type of ICD therapy during follow-up, we found participants with higher comorbidity burden were more likely to experience inappropriate than appropriate therapy, with once again the strongest association in ICD recipients with eight or more comorbidities. 
So I'm going to going over the results of our cluster analyses, <laughs> which were unfortunately a little bit unsuccessful. Um, the way you read this diagram is you look uh, across the values of the bottom, the semi-partial R squared, um, a smaller values for this are better. And you've got a value that, best, um, that you think best represents um, a good number and composition of clusters that you could find clinically reasonable and meaningful. So for example, let's say that we agree to a threshold of 0 0.02 for our semi-partial R squared. This would result in 12 clusters. Uh, and unfortunately, um, this would, we would find that nine of these 12 clusters contained only single comorbidities, such as dyslipidemia or hypertension. Um, in addition, in the three clusters that we did find that contained more than one comorbidity, um, we see that from a clinical standpoint, they don't really make all that much sense. So if you look at cluster seven, um, the grouping of pre-valvular surgery, osteoporosis, and diabetes does not really uh, make that much sense clinically. So we were a little bit disappointed in that. We also wanted to uh, see if we could apply diagnostic testing to see if we could come up with an ideal number of clusters based not on our clinical insight but purely on the data. So as I mentioned, we had used um, a statistic called the pseudo-F, which is the ratio of between cluster variants to within cluster variants. And you generally want to choose a number of clusters that results in a large pseudo-F statistic. Well, unfortunately, our diagnostics told us that, at least for our data, the clusters were not very well differentiated until we reached about 20 or so clusters, which is not very meaningful when you're only looking at 24 comorbidities. That's meaning that most, comorbid most comorbidities are being placed in single bins. So while we're a little bit disappointed, I think that there's, you know, there's a silver lining um, that our findings may speak to an emerging consensus that you know, statistical analyses alone, such as our data-driven cluster analyses or recent uh, latent class analyses performed by Dr. Whitson's group at Duke, they might not be as promising as we might have thought they were in identifying meaningful groups of comorbidity. Um, so I hope that I'm proven wrong about this and, and uh, that, you know, in the future we can find meaningful clusters of comorbidities that impact outcomes, but we did in, in, in this case. To summarize, we found that higher comorbidity burden was associated with worse therapy outcomes in ICD recipients, um, including shorter time to first inappropriate therapy, higher burden of inappropriate therapy, and greater risk of inappropriate versus appropriate therapy. Um, interestingly, higher comorbidity burden was not associated with risk of appropriate ICD therapy. Um, and we often found a monotonic relationship between comorbidity counts and risk of these outcomes, so that participants with eight or more comorbidities face the greatest risk of inappropriate therapy. So the associated with the excess risk of ICD therapies among multimorbid patients is um, unclear at this point. Uh, prior literature has shown that multimorbidity contributes to chronic uh, low-grade uh, uh, pro-inflammatory states, and that in turn, um, chronic inflammation may increase the risk for certain arrhythmias that could prompt inappropriate therapy. I also think that it might be possible that higher comorbidity burden may disrupt the accuracy of ICD sensing, um, although we don't know how this would happen, perhaps through unknown metabolic or physiologic pathways. Uh, let it's possible that findings may be attributed to discrete effects of higher rates of individual comorbidities, um, such as atrial fibrillation and high comorbidity groups. But we did control for individual, certain individual comorbidities um, in our analyses, and this is also something we're investigating in sensitivity analyses. So several notable strengths, um, including a large demographically diverse patient cohort on which a wide range of uh, comorbidities were captured. The study employed a, a really rigorous process of identifying and confirming the types and appropriateness of ICD therapy in this cohort. Um, but these strengths are balanced by some limitations, um, primary of which is that 15% of the ICD therapies could not be adjudicated, um, even after undergoing the rigorous process that they did. Uh, also, we didn't have data on specific ICD models or programming strategies used. But this, we think, is okay because that means that our findings reflect the heterogeneity of ICD devices and settings that were out there during the study period. Um, lastly, we had limited data on the severity of each comorbidity, which could potentially influence therapy outcomes. 
some patients, we believe that our findings have, have some important implications for shared decision making about ICDs, um, especially among multimorbid patients and their physicians. A uh, decision to place an ICD should be individualized for each patient um, and include discussions about the risk of adverse outcomes, such as inappropriate therapy, and whether these risks are consistent with the patient's goals of care. Uh, physicians should engage in frank discussions about the risks and benefits of ICDs and what alternative treatments are available. For multimorbid patients who wish to proceed with ICD implantation, physicians may consider um, ICD device settings that minimize the risk of inappropriate therapy, um, such as delayed therapy settings. Um, and physicians should also be prepared to discuss the potential for ICD deactivation um, should the competing risks of death uh, or the burdens of ICD therapy um, come to outweigh the survival benefits. So I hope that the findings from this project encourage us to all think a little bit more deeply about these life-saving yet costly and potentially disruptive devices um, and the trade-offs that uh, adults with multiple chronic conditions may face um, between qu quantity and quality of life. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. The trade-off that uh, patients may face uh, when deciding about ICD uh, implantation. And I'd like to thank um, the great collaborators from the HCSRN, um, principally uh, Dr. Alan Goh, the senior PI on the project, um, and uh, all the Pepper Center collaborators as well uh, for contributing to this work. And I'd like to recognize our funding, most notably the NIA Aging Initiative Grant and the several uh, funding sources for the LSICD, as well as the, the T32 training grant that funds me. So thank you very much for your time, and I'll send things back to Heather. All right, Mr. Heideck, for that, that excellent and very clear presentation. Um, and also congratulations again to you and your team um, for receiving uh, this pilot award. Um, and now, I think without further ado, since we've already done um, discussions, um, I will turn things over to Dr. Tanetti, just with a reminder that if people would like to use their Q&A function, um, to, that they can submit questions, and at time permitting, we'll discuss at the end. Um, thank you, Dr. Tanetti. Uh, thank you. Can you uh, pass the slides on to, to my slides? I think uh, the slide. oh, I got it now. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? We can. You. Thank, so thank you so much for inviting me uh, to do this, and, and uh, thank you, Dr. Heideck. That was very, very uh, interesting, and I think well exemplifies some of the issues related to the care of older adults with multiple chronic conditions. In the next 20 minutes or so, um, I would like to um, build on uh, the wonderful work of, of Dr. Goes and I do a study to describe some of the limitations of current decision making and care for persons with multiple chronic conditions. And so to make some suggestions where we as a field need to go in both research and in care to improve the care of this uh, growing population. I like to sort of personalize it. Although we, in this particular study, almost 2,800 people were, studied, they were all individuals with with lives and issues. And I think it's 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 always important to go from the population data back to the individual stories if we're really going to um, the best advantage of the research that we do. So I want to introduce you to Mr. T, who's an 83-year-old man who complains of fatigue, decreased appetite, and weakness and was very burdened by his health care tasks. He cared for perhaps by one of the health systems that are part of this collaborative. Um, and he presents uh, with multiple chronic conditions. He has 10 that require 12 to 14 guideline recommended medications. His chronic conditions are listed on the slide, and most of them are those that are included in uh, the study that we just heard, heard about, including previous MI, um, diabetes, um, hypertension, depression, heart failure, etc. Not a very atypical patient at all, quite similar to that I see every day, but as you can see, um, not necessarily typical of the patients that were in the original clinical trials that told us about the benefit of ICD placement, but are um, like the patients that receive them in actual practice. So he was cared for um, by excellent 
uh, clinicians who follow evidence-based guidelines for the best possible care. His cardiologist thinks he needs to increase his beta blocker and continue warfarin, diuretic, and statin for his various cardiac diseases, and thinks because of his ejection fraction, it's not time to consider a defibrillator, much as we heard in the previous uh, study. His endocrinologist is concerned about his hemoglobin A1C and his fracture risk and thinks it's time to start insulin and bisphosphonate. His kidney doctor nephrologist is concerned about his renal function and, and discusses with Mr. T that he might have to start dialysis soon. His, his, his psychiatrist then, um, in contradiction to his cardiologist, is concerned that his beta blocker may be worsening his depression and thinks we need to dis discontinue it and perhaps start another antidepressant. His gastroenterologist, who is concerned about his peptic ulcer disease, thinks it's time to consider stopping or being the pluses and minuses with pros and cons of his warfarin therapy. Each of these excellent clinicians follows the outcomes that are relevant for their own particular part of Mr. T's um, disease combination, um, including avoiding sudden death with um, ICD, um, putting strokes, recurrent eye, fracture, rehospitalization for his heart failure, and gastrointestinal bleed. Also are concerned about his blood pressure and heart rate control and improving his depression. So to this state-of-the-art evidence-based care for Mr. T, as you can see, conflicting recommendations across his clinicians who are caring for different ones of his conditions. Uh, you can see why he feels burdened by his care tasks, which add up to about 20 visits per month to his various clinicians, plus lab tests in between. His myriad of self-management tasks, his multiple medications that are complex to remember to take, and each have adverse consequences. And now he's at risk for more procedures, including dialysis and ICD. So he's received state-of-the-art care. He remains fatigued, weak, and decreased appetite. So Mr. T, an outlier, is he just an, un, an unusual patient um, that doesn't fit our profile? Um, and the evidence would suggest otherwise. Um, in CMS data from a couple of years ago, we find that over 18 and a half million Medicare beneficiaries, 37% of those receiving Medicare, have four or more chronic conditions, and they consume about three quarters of the Medicare budget. But it's not just an issue with older adults. Multiple morbidity is the norm of adults receiving health care across the age span, with the majority of health care used by those with at least two chronic conditions. Um, so we know from the data that Mr. T is not an outlier, but rather that multiple conditions is the norm in healthcare today for adults. Single disease is uh, the current outlier in our healthcare system. So what is the problem that's represented by the care of older adults with multiple chronic conditions as well reflected in the work that Dr. Heider just presented to us? Also with multiple and complex conditions receive a lot of care. Lack of access is not the issue. But the care, as shown by Mr. T, is fragmented across providers and settings, with each clinician focusing on a subset of the patient's conditions. And this care, as reflected in the work that Dr. Hijack presented, can be potentially harmful and of unclear benefit. But most importantly, Importantly, it's not always focused on what matters most to these individual patients. So I know that this care is fragmented in some wonderful work several years ago by my HIFAM that's been reproduced by other uh, studies is that this care is fragmented with individuals with multiple chronic conditions. So on average, seven different physicians each year, again, each of whom focuses on a different set of conditions. But there is equally fragmented for the providers, for the clinicians. And in the work of my fam, she also found that the typical primary care clinician who cares for Medicare beneficiaries 
with multiple chronic conditions are required to coordinate with 229 different providers for their patients each year. An incredibly fragmented system that is difficult for patient and clinician alike. And this here again is of certain benefit. As Dr. Hyde said in relation to ICDs, individuals in the randomized controlled trials that generate the evidence typically are younger and healthier than the clinical populations who then receive the uh, intervention studied in these pristine randomized control trials. So this leaves us with a lot of uncertainty of whether the data that is identified in a randomized control trial population is relevant for our patients that we see in the clinic. It's also uncertain how much benefit an individual is going to have when they're at risk for multiple different outcomes, not just for the outcome that was studied. But and apart from that, it really begs the question, with multiple chronic conditions, what outcome should define benefit? For Mr. T, is it his sun death that's prevented? Is it recurrent MI? Is it his depression getting better? How do we even define benefit in this population? Having a little with my thing there. This, there is also a potential harm. And work that we completed a few years ago, in random, uh, a representative sample of Medicare beneficiaries nationally, we found that 20%, one out of five Medicare beneficiaries received one or more guideline recommended medication that is likely to harm one or more of their coexisting conditions. And in work that was done a decade ago, but it has been replicated since then, that the risk of adverse drug event increases about 10% per medication taking. So we know that of our population, such as Mr. T, that again represents about a third of the Medicare population, they have 100% chance of having at least one adverse drug event, um, medications that are taking to treat one or more of their chronic conditions. So clear, it is not a matter of uncertain harm. This is a matter of definite harm that uh, we have to grapple with. It's also burdensome, and this is work that has been increasingly um, recognized by really uh, several outstanding um, instigators, many of whom are part of, the, uh, of this collaborative. In work that Dr. Boyd did about a decade ago now, where um, she looked at treatment regimens based on practice guidelines are uh, several commonly recommended uh, for very common conditions found that the amount of, of tasks that people would have to complete during their day was basically unsustainable with having a life outside of managing their care. And that's reflected on the left side of the slide. You can't really read the slide very well. And that that really represents the fact that patients really can't do that, what we're asking of them. And I think that really opened the door to looking at burden as in the heart of the equation in the care of this population. And work that Dr. Bynum, who's part of the Dartmouth Atlas Project, uh, presented on about a year ago, found that older adults with multiple chronic conditions have about 25 contact days per year to care for their chronic conditions, including time spent in the hospital, during an ambulatory visit, getting a procedure, or imaging study. So almost 10% of their daily life is spent carrying out a healthcare task in relationship with the healthcare community, means that they can't do other things in their life. Victoria, who's been a leader in this field as well, in one of his studies, quotes one of his um, partners who said, care for my chronic conditions is now more burdensome to me than the conditions themselves. So burden is a major issue. And back to the study that we just heard about from Dr. Heideck, the ICDs really does well illustrate both the greater harm and burden of care for individuals with multiple chronic conditions. I show 
showed compared to those with only one to three coexisting conditions, that those that with four to five um, versus six to seven or eight or more chronic conditions, the adjusted hazard ratio of having an inappropriate therapy went from 1.9 to 2.9, almost three times the likelihood of an adverse um, treatment from the ICD, an inappropriate shock. Um, threefold, that is really a major increase in adverse events. We very rarely see any intervention that will give you a threefold likelihood of, of benefit. So I think this really puts in perspective the difficulty of, of harm for our patients with multiple chronic conditions. But the whole concept of, quote, inappropriate therapy or, of, of quote, appropriate therapy with ICDs also raises the question whether the care that we provide, the interventions that we study are addressing what really matters most to individuals with multiple chronic conditions. And this, the ICD is really a classic example of that clinicians and researchers focus on very, very discrete disease-specific outcomes as selected by an appropriate therapy being a shock for ventricular uh, uh, dysrhythmia and inappropriate therapy being a shock for any other other um, uh, rhythmia. This is a very clinician, not uh, centric definition by its very nature. And it suggests that perhaps the we currently are studying conditions may not target at what matters most to individuals. And it really begs the question that for many of these 2,700 individuals in the study, and for Mr. T, does reducing the risk of sun death does really reflect the patient's priorities? And a suggestion that it may not always be the case is provided by work by Terry Fried here at Yale and by others who had, had several different studies where she really asked the questions, what does matter to individuals when faced with the trade-offs between their outcomes and between their various conditions? And we found in a series of studies is that when individuals are faced with the priorities of what matters most to them, the highest priority that older adults with multiple chronic conditions um, are focused on is maintaining function of 42%. Relieving pain or other symptoms versus function or longevity is about 32%. Only 7%, less than a third of individuals with multiple chronic conditions prioritize keeping alive over or pain. So it begs the question, what's the role of ICD and other treatments in these individuals? And are we um, studying the kinds of questions that matter to individuals? It really begs the question, where do we need to go in research and practice with these individuals with multiple chronic conditions? Try to answer that question. I will tell you I don't have the answer. A couple of years ago, with funding from the John A. Hartford Foundation and now with additional funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Gordon Bay Moore Foundation, and the Patient Centered Outcome Research Institute, uh, we have um, brought together um, stakeholders um, from multiple different groups in work that was originally called Caroline. We're now calling Patient Priority Aligned Care. And it's a consortium of patients, caregivers, clinicians, national provider, and patient organizations, health systems, and payers. Convene them over a period of time with face-to-face -face, uh, meetings and uh, webinars and ongoing advisory groups and ask them, what are issues that we need to address to improve the care and outcomes of persons with multiple chronic conditions? And based on these issues, can you help us design a feasible, sustainable approach that addresses these issues? And um, some of the results of those initial sort of qualitative um, work, the patient and, and caregiver perspective, some of the key themes that they identified for us, is they were crystal clear, loud and clear, that patients' goals, not just their diseases, should drive all care. 
Um, then very interestingly, they said that most, if not all, treatments were preference sensitive. And those of us are clinicians and researchers know that that in the lexicon of researchers and, and, and clinicians, a few conditions and few treatments are considered preference sensitive. But patients are telling us all treatments are, are preference sensitive, but doctors and clinicians don't see that way. Um, as one person said, doctors think they know best what patients should do. I thought that was a, a, a telling um, thing that I think it should inform our research going forward. They also said that patients, not clinicians or researchers, should identify what a bad outcome is. And that everybody needs a somebody. That is reflected by Mr. T, that's very frustrated and, um, and actually very nervous when multiple different providers gives them different recommendations, and they want somebody who can collect all this information and help them identify what's the best strategy for them. They also said that people differ in what treatment burden is worth for them, for the outcome that they're likely to obtain. And so they vary in their care preferences, what they're willing and able to do for their outcomes, as well as in the outcome. Themselves. And that should re be reflected both in the care that we give and the research that we do. Primary and, and specialty clinicians also um, were um, very vocal on what mattered to them in the care of these complex populations. Not surprisingly, they felt financial and non financial incentives were necessary to support this complex care. They didn't see, they didn't feel prepared the way clinical practice is presently structured or financed to provide this care. They also felt that clear roles and responsibilities were, were necessary. They were also frustrated by the conflicting uh, recommendations that resulted. And they wanted a framework for communication across their colleagues, recognizing that nobody can communicate with 229 people. Recognizing as a result, they really needed a smaller network of people that they needed to interact with to provide the care to their population. We're also very vocal that current metrics were not appropriate for this population. The disease-oriented metrics such as hemoglobin A1C, blood pressure measurements, only add to the burden and harm of this population, that quality metrics needed to be more patient and less disease-focused. They also, I think, for the researchers on the call, really rallied with the idea that they need evidence of what works in this population. They're very well aware that current evidence base generated by clinical trials is not appropriate for this population. They actually like the idea of knowing what their patients wanted prior to the visits. They, they defer to disease-based care because that's what they know, but they're willing to, to incorporate patients' preferences if they know what they are. And they also wanted other clinicians to honor the changes that um, they may not keep changing um, there that they had, had worked out with their patients. So everybody was frustrated. There's also um, said, yes, research in this area is really important. They want to know how to provide care more efficiently and cost effectively. And they acknowledged they did not know how to take care of this population, which is of great importance to them, obviously, because they are among the highest utilizers. And also for researchers on the phone that are looking at interventions, they were also loud and clear, don't give us another role that we have to fill. Don't give us another intervention that requires additional staff. Where we need to make do with the staff we have, change what the current staff does. And I think that we heard that loud and clear, and I think that's something that's important for researchers who are doing interventions to know. One of the ways that we conceptualize the feedback that we got on what research and care for this population should look like is reflected in this diagram I borrowed from um, a um, work that came out of a uh, Corey uh, uh, workshop several years ago where we brought together, that brought together patients, caregivers, health systems, clinicians, and researchers that was like Kurt Stangy. Um, that um, Elizabeth Bayless, who is also an active part of, of, of our group, uh, look in terms of, of the, what the contents of research should be for this population. And they identified the vast majority of research currently occurs within the 
within an orange circle. It's all about the evidence that generates the guideline. It's all about the disease. But they really felt that clinical decision and research should really be based on that intersection of the evidence, goals and preferences, and life context. And certainly see work in life context as we look at some of the social determinants of health. A little bit of work on goals and preferences, a lot of work in evidence, and almost none that work together in that sweet spot that brings it all together. And I think that's really where research on this population needs to increasingly go. We have been trying to do this in our recommended approach with this patient goal-directed care. In the next couple of minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about where we are in that work. Um, for us, it's really a move from disease outcome-centered care and research to patient priority-centered care and research. That's where we think really is the sweet spot for caring for this population with multiple chronic conditions. And it's very simple what patient health priority line care should look like. A member of the healthcare team helps the patients identify or lexicon of, 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 a decision, of medical decision makers, help them construct their health priorities. The patients who care for these individuals then align their care with achieving these health priorities. And it really ends up being that decision making is predicated on achieving not disease-based goals per se, but achieving patients' health outcome goals within the context of their care preferences. And I mean by their health outcome goals and care preferences. Outcome goals um, are really the outcomes, the life goals that patients want from healthcare. It's why they are willing to put up with the healthcare visits, put up with our hospitalization procedures. Um, informed decision making, it needs to be smart goals, specific, measurable, actionable, and reliable goals. An example might be for somebody with heart failure and COPD and a panoply of other chronic conditions, the ability to walk about two blocks or one flight of stairs a day without having to stop for shortness of breath. And it's important to know that these outcome goals are distinct from behavioral goals, such as stopping smoking, or these goals, such as improving hemoglobin A1C or blood pressure. The other part of the equation is the outcomes they want for what they're willing to do, and that's the care preference part. And preferences are really the patient activities or workload. Workload is what a patient is willing and able to do and to tolerate to achieve their own particular stated SMART goals. Um, and it includes healthcare utilization, medications, self-management tasks, and procedures. And it's more what patients are willing to, uh, able to do, it becomes care burden or treatment burden. And so based on the work we've done today, as we see the guidance principles for patient priority aligned care, again, directly from our stakeholders of patients, clinicians, health systems, etc., is that patient health priorities, not just their diseases, should drive all care and communications. That it's easy to say is everybody should focus on the same outcome. I mean, how could we have a health system where somebody focuses on preventing sun death, somebody else focuses on Preventing their depression, some of us focuses on whether or not they're going to have a stroke. How can we design a, a coordinated care for that individual if we're focusing on different outcomes? Um, and similar to this is roles and responsibilities need to be agreed to. And we find even in um, integrated health systems, this doesn't currently happen. Health decision making for this population also needs to acknowledge uncertainty of both benefits and, most frankly, certainty of harm. Um, also needs to incorporate uh, health issues. And most importantly, we need to make more explicit the multiple trials these individuals are faced. And I think the work that um, Dr. Hyde just, uh, just described really identifies it very well. There's a lot of trade-offs involved in ICD decisions that I would suspect are not really addressed with any of these almost 2,800 participants. So I sort of think about it. Recent care for persons with multiple chronic conditions need to 
from the current disease focused in care that you need blank for your blank, or research does X treatment or improve Y disease measure in the case of ICDs, ICDs uh, does ICD placement improve the likelihood that you're going to have sudden death in the past in the next year? Is that really the question that drives decision making for this population? To research that inform the the ability for a clinician to to really answer the question. There are several things that we could do, but knowing your priorities, knowing all of your conditions, and really what's most important to you, I suggest we do this. That needs to be drug decision making over the next several years for this population of adults with multiple chronic conditions. So going back to Mr. T to give you an example of what this care might look like, um, you actually did ascertain his his health outcome goals and care preferences, he would tell you that having fewer symptoms and better function today is what matters most to me, not life prolongation. In terms of his care preferences, he wants fewer medications because he's convinced that they're causing many of his symptoms that he's concerned about, his fatigue and decreased appetite. He would spend less of his time seeing his clinicians and having to visit them all. And he clearly he only wants procedures that are going to help his function and symptoms, not necessarily prolong his life. So health priorities aligned care for him would include reducing or stopping several of his medications that are currently recommended by guidelines, probably eliminating many of his dietary restrictions. Um, SCD probably is not consistent with the outcome. Um, outcome goals or his care preferences. You might try dialysis, but would probably stop if his symptoms and function didn't improve um, over a period of time. And most importantly, how do we integrate decision making across clinicians? I think that is really a, a very large unanswered question that um, researchers um, and clinicians need to work together with patients and their caregivers to really answer the question, how do we integrate decision making across conditions and across clinicians? I leave you, I think, well, I think where we need to go um, with, with research in this population. First and foremost, uh, this can't be answered by researchers alone or clinicians alone. We need multiple stakeholders on the team right from the very beginning, including patients, caregivers, health systems, individuals and as well as researchers. We need to move from these simple outcomes such as survival or hemoglobin A1C or other or even stroke prevention to outcomes that patients um, talk about, including functions and symptoms. Recognizing that individuals care about different care differently for these different outcomes and how do we incorporate that into our into our research. We need to incorporate patients' goals and preferences and the variability in their goals and preferences as well as the life context into all research we do in this population. We need to measure the burden of intervention as well as benefit of intervention uh, in all of the work that we do in this population. And as well uh, uh, exemplified by Dr. Hyde's uh, work, we're unable to come up with clusters um, to show how heterogeneous this population is. We cannot avoid that. This is a population where there cannot be and will not be a one-size-fits-all um, answer. Average benefit and average harm has really no significance for this population. So we need to have sample sizes that really allow us to look at key subgroups based on conditions um, as well as other factors. Again, a lot of challenges but I think what we need to do um, to provide um, the good care informed by decisions um, search in this population. And I'm going to there for um, um, your time. Thank you much, Dr. Nettie. That was uh, a wonderful talk. And um, as, as you well know, um, I have been a big fan of, of your work um, for long before you knew who I was. Um, so we do have one question here, um, and I encourage other folks, if you have questions, um, to use your Q&A function. Um, so this question says, um, 
for uh, the, the patient in, in your slides for Mr. T, would you simultaneously address how to manage health crises? For example, hospitalizations and acute care, you could imagine increased hospitalizations for heart failure um, when dietary restrictions are liberalized. Uh, for that's, that's a great question, and again, I think the simple answer is we need the research to address these questions in an evidence-based way. I would say uh, in the interim is that this is a perfect example of a trade-off, um, and, and um, it's certainly in my own care, I'm faced with these patients all the time, and there's different dietary restrictions, right? And certainly the salt restriction, which is, I suspect, what the question, question you're getting at, so you probably would not, he probably would not want to um, realize his salt intake if it, mean, if it meant more um, hospitalizations for his heart failure. Um, but I probably would be willing to liberalize some of his diabetic restrictions that um, may, may fit, into, uh, fit into his care preferences better. So the key thing is, and that's how you align their outcomes their care preferences, right? Is it is a negotiation between the? You can't look at, gosh, I want to. Re, you need to need to um, reduce your hospitalizations, or you need to restrict your or your uh, salt. Is that negotiation between the salt restriction and the hospitalization is what to align your care with each individual's outcome goals? Thank you. So I have I have a question for myself. Um, so in, in honor of uh, MACRA being finalized this month, um, question is, you know, I think that the real um, this is trying to figure out how to how to measure and assess when people are doing it right, how to get the quality control right, so that the system can be engineered to incentivize and to reward people are shifting for these patients from a disease-focused paradigm to a preference-focused paradigm. So my question is, how, how, long, how, how much closer do you think the system is getting to being able to figure that out, and how do you think we as the research community can or should help form that discussion? Probably an answer that would take, then I could probably <laughs> do another 30, 40 minutes on. It's a great question, Heather, and an, an important, incredibly important one. Um, I think I think we're at a state of heightened awareness on the part of um, CMS um, and other quality groups that they would love to move from disease-based to patient-based um, metrics. They're waiting for people like us to develop them. Um, it's, it's, let's just face it, it's a lot easier to measure blood pressure and or measure hemoglobin A1C than it is to ascertain each individual's um, uh, uh, treatment burden or outcome goals and whether they were ascertained. Um, and I think uh, I, would, I would say that these, uh, those of us on this phone are some of the people that need to be at the table developing uh, the metrics that will drive the care. There already are a few, increase, a few of, of patient rather than disease-based measures that are available. Um, we have a very long way to go, and, and um, I'm, I'm very worried that MassCray is going to push us farther towards disease-based care. And ironically, we work result in decreased quality of care for this population, an unintended consequence. Thanks. Um, so I have a couple of more questions. Um, here's a question that says, as well as patient goals and presses, we really must consider the environment, physical, financial, social, and the caregiver. Caregiver goals, preferences, and practical ability are very, very important criteria also um, when patients look at health care issues. Um, do you comment on that? I'd agree more, and I think that's, that was subsumed on my comment about life context, um, and you're exactly right. Um, it, I could not agree more. I think caregiver burden is a very, very big piece um, in, in, in all this and, and, and all the other life contexts in terms of functional and social um, and social issues. But it's you know it's it's a you know we can't even capture um, for the patient right now. And you know much of this now is moved towards electronic health records, and we can't even capture patients' own goals and and symptoms and function much less what's happening in the life around them. I think that is a very big area of research and hopefully done in a way that's feasible for uh, uh, dissemination 
to practice. I think uh, I, I think that's a real wide open area of investigation. Great. Um, so another question is, could you comment on how researchers in accruing data to discuss the impact of therapy can should adjust for the varying impact of certain conditions like dementia um, with others such as dyslip dyslipidemia, so differing weight of burden and impact? Uh, I think probably multiple questions right um, in there. I think, first of all, is uh, to to be cognizant of the fact that there are there certainly are what I would consider sort of dominant conditions that if they're present, they sort of change everything. Um, I, and certainly, I would put dementia in, in that category. Uh, advanced cancer might be another. Frankly, any advanced disease, I think, puts you sort of in a diff category. When, when you look at the effect of treatments for any other coexisting conditions, it, it really sort of, it, it, you, you all have to look um, within the confines of, of that um, defining condition to look at, at the effect of any other treatment. I think there's a lot of work being looked at in terms of how do you define morbidity burden. Um, we don't have a good measure that I'm aware of. Um, I've seen, uh, I just reviewed an article where they try to sort of weigh the severity of different um, uh, chronic conditions and um, with, with the tools that are currently available, particularly through the EHR, it's very difficult to come up with a burden, uh, a morbidity burden that's better than count. Um, but there is no question that an asymptomatic condition such as dyslipidemia or hypertension is going to have a very different uh, burden than something like dementia or heart failure, and I think we need to we need to have much better measures of of morbidity burden for this population. A, a related question, and, and for Ali, um, about um, when you have specific conditions. So this is when someone has very high morbidity burden, such as eight multiple chronic conditions. Um, what's your sense on how often there's a dominant condition, such as end-stage renal disease uh, or advanced CKD that's present, and is there any data on the hierarchical strengths of association among specific comorbidities, uh, specifically for the outcomes of inappropriate sh shocks um, or for cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular deaths? Well, great question, and I, I certainly 100% agree with, with Dr. Tonetti that, you know, there are dominant conditions that will sort of blow other conditions out of the water if you have advanced dementia, and, but you also have you know, mild kidney disease and hyperlipidemia and hypertension. Those things don't really matter as much as the advanced dementia or the advanced cancer. Um, we did see um, pretty uh, linear relationships between our comorbidity groups and the, the prevalence of, uh, of certain comorbidities within the comorbidity group. So, for example, the, uh, the questionnaire um, offered the example of ESRD. And why we don't have um, severity of chronic kidney disease in this study, or we didn't look at that, we, we did see a graded increase in incidence of chronic kidney disease in our comorbidity groups, um, and that will be evident in our table one. But for example, 77% of the eight plus comorbidity group had some type of chronic kidney disease. Um, I won't, uh, I won't uh, give away uh, all our secrets right now, but there are a number of papers, I'm happy to report, coming out of the longitudinal study on ICDs, and one by uh, Dr. Greenlee, which is currently under review, looks at individual comorbidities and how they affect uh, the risk of inappropriate shocks or, or inappropriate therapy. So um, that, those data will be forthcoming in the literature, so I, I ask that you stay tuned for that. And comes to the end of the questions that um, have been submitted. I'll give more moment in case somebody is furiously typing. We a few questions from James. Um, and, um, the first one is, what size measures appearing in the EMRs perhaps have captured function? symptoms or burdens, um, which measures might have highest utility at this juncture, and how might, we, how might we capture the longitudinal changes which occur with care preferences? Um, a second question from him is, um, how might our medical record systems be updated to capture the nuances of multimorbidity and complex context of each individual patient? 
I mean, me to repeat some of that. <laughs> Probably repeat all, all of it. Uh, do you want to take that? <laughs> oh, Mary, I was definitely hoping that you would take this. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, those are really wonderful questions. I don't think I, I don't think that there are any um, straight answers at this point. I'm sure Mary can speak more intelligently about what kind of functional and burden-based measures might be um, good to include in the EMR. I do know I do a lot of medical record review as part of the Silver AMI study, um, adjudicating certain geriatric outcomes, and I do find that simple measures um, in the EMR are so helpful for determining function. You know, there are some, there, you know, NYU, for example, does a great job of reporting in the medical record whether or not a patient can walk. And while this is very rarely reported in other EMRs, for me, it, it tells me so very much about the patient's health status. You know, ambulation is a huge part of quality of life, of independence, and I think including simple measures until we have the, uh, the research um, and the evidence base um, for promulgating, you know, evidence-based uh, patient-centered outcomes measures, I think simple measures such as ambulation, appetite, vision, hearing, whether they can walk up a flight of stairs, whether they can dress themselves, you know, the basic ADLs, I think those are hugely important for captioning function and symptoms and, and what types of care um, older adults might be looking for. I agree with you. I, I think um, it, it, the question about standardization, there's almost nothing standardized within uh, EHRs uh, for anybody who um, is, a, is a clinician in the, uh, in the audience would probably agree. And um, there, there now is being um, increased push to have some standardized measures, but again, they're almost always um, as part of registries and as part of uh, a specific um, diagnosis and treatment, for instance. Um, for night replacement. Um, that's that sort of very, very specific measure for a very specific intervention will probably increasingly be included in the EHRs, but not for not for the kind of patients that that that, that we're talking about, the kind of more global um, measures of, of symptoms and function. And putting my clinician hat on is that those of us who have to live in the world of EHRs um, that have so dominated the clinical encounter, the thought of being mandated to um, include even more is will bring, bring great streams and howl from our clinician colleagues. Um, so it's a real it's a it, it, it's a real dilemma. If, I mean, on the one hand, it's absolutely ridiculous when with multiple chronic conditions, what matters most of them is function. You're lucky if one, as Ali said, only only one of the sites even identifies whether people walk. There's such a disconnect between what people want from their health and what's involved in what, what you can get from an EHR is really a major gap. And, and I know that there are groups working on it. CMS is very interested. PCOR is interested. There are many groups working on trying to get more patient-reported outcomes into the EHR, but it's still a very long way to go. Thank you. And I see another another couple of questions have come in. This one um, from Ken Alexander. How do we manage issues and symptoms of aging or frailty which continue for those with multiple chronic conditions after medical interventions have already been applied? These individuals seek answers from doctors and may risk escalation of unnecessary care. Um, well, um, there's uh, a great question. It's a difficult question. It, it basically you've just asked the question: Is how do you practice geriatric medicine? Maybe for that one too, you have there. It's basically um, it, this is the whole concept, right? Of of the um, knowing what the outcomes they want and what they're willing and able to do to to, uh, to get that care. That is that is the question we're really trying to answer with patient priority line. Care is that you don't offer anything that's not in isolation of knowing what the outcomes are that you want to um, that you want to achieve, and 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 what you offer um, ends up being the focus of negotiation around the trade-offs with individuals. Um, and and I mean an example again could be. Um, so with heart failure, I don't want to take a diuretic because I have to urinate too often. 
but I also don't want to be short of breath when I go up the stairs. So, so again, it's when you when you discuss the treatment and the burden of the treatment within the confines of the outcomes that you're likely to get from it is when hopefully you get the sweet spot in terms of what what care is necessary and what care is not necessary. I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. Um, I have another question. Um, so uh, this question says, do you have thoughts, Mary, on how researchers should perhaps assess multiple chronic conditions, frailty, and disability through database searches? Um, well, I think you can certainly study it better through database than you will through EHRs right now, because the EHRs just do not have that type of data. Um, I I know that they are, I'm not, I'm not a database expert, um, but I know there are increasing numbers of large data sets that do have these data. And actually, you may be a little closer to that than I am in terms of, I know the NIA has several databases that um, include um, frailty and, and function. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there are, there are I think the, the importance of concepts like frailty and disability um, are really becoming apparent. I know that there are some CMS-based um, algorithms that have been applied, um, if not to the LSICD, to the NCDR registry data to look at these types of um, impairments. So the, th these types of, um, of, of constructs are available um, in databases, but I, I couldn't exactly point you to a specific database. Um, but I would suggest just, you know, looking at the big, um, the big studies coming out. NHATS, um, I'm sure, has some measures of MCC and frailty, and, dis and they, of course, have measures of disability. So looking at those big um, nationally funded studies might be a good place to start. Um, uh, Alita, uh, Loina is um, added to the discussion saying uh, many of the, and this is, it was about the question earlier about EMR and, and finding um, nuanced information in the EMR. It says many of the functional measures are in the rehabilitation area of the EMR. Perhaps rehab therapists need to work on improving their measures and maybe we need to move their placement and access um, so that they can be used by all. Uh, that's a great point. In my experience, the physical therapy and occupational therapy notes are are are, all, are, are almost always the best place to get good um, data um, function. Although I will have to say that since we've moved to the HR, some of that data is not as rich as it used to be. But it, I, that that's a great point. That's a wonderful point. I think um, I threw the questions that we have. Um, I think you might be seeing them before their way to my screen. So if Austin, let me know. I've made it through all the questions that have been submitted. Okay. Thank you so much to both of our speakers um, for um, in what, what was clearly um, thought-provoking um, and discussion-provoking um, talks. Uh, so I really appreciate both of um, your time and congratulations again to um, Allie and her team on, on the Pilot Award. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, and thanks, everybody, for your time.